talk about the soteriological motivation of some 4th century arguments for the divinity of the Son and the Holy Spirit. What did the Church's ideas about salvation have to do with its ideas about the Trinity? For Athanasius and other Greek fathers, salvation is conceived of as deification. Now, literally, deification means becoming God. However, when the Greek fathers talked about humans being deified in salvation, they did not mean it in a woodenly literal sense. Indeed, it's important to understand just what they meant by the word and what they did not mean. We can start with what they didn't mean. Deification is not a matter of erasing the difference between God the Creator and us as creatures. The fathers consistently say that there's a gulf between God and us that cannot be bridged in such a way that we change from being what we are by nature to what God is by nature. However, they also say that salvation in Christ means not only the healing of our nature insofar as it's become corrupted by sin and subject to death, but what's much more, salvation means bridging the gulf between God and us in such a way that we attain union with God. In response to this, one might say, Okay, sure, that's pretty standard fare in Christian soteriology, but to describe our final glorification as deification seems like it's going too far. However, the fathers see this language as simply accurately describing what follows from two core truths of the faith, that of the Incarnation and that of our union with Christ, which occurs when we are adopted as sons and daughters of God the Father. A key passage of scripture here comes from John chapter 10, which tells the story of one of Jesus' encounters with hostile Jewish authorities. Some of them are preparing to stone him for blasphemy for making himself out to be God, and Jesus responds with a couple of questions. He starts by quoting Psalm 82, in which God addresses some people as gods with a small g. Jesus asks, Is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. If it calls them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be set aside, can you say that the one whom the Father has consecrated and sent into the world blasphemes because I said I am the Son of God? Here, the people whom God is quoted as telling that they are gods are the people to whom the word of God came. From what I've pointed out in previous lectures about the concept of Jesus as the Logos or the Word of God, it'll probably be no surprise that when someone like Athanasius reads about the Word of God coming to human beings, he thinks of the Word becoming flesh. On his reading of this passage, the Logos, who is God with a capital G, has come to us to make us gods with a lowercase g. In fact, one of Athanasius' most famous lines says of the word, For he was made man that man might be made God, or gods, depending on the translation. Now, one may well ask, in what possible way could an Orthodox Christian ever say that human beings become gods? When we answer that, we have to bear in mind that Athanasius probably thinks that he's simply interpreting the Savior's own words. But even if we don't share this exegetical consideration with him, the answer to the question is at least twofold. First, in our final glorification, God will confer on us the gifts of sinlessness and immortality, such that we possess by grace what God alone possesses by nature. In those two ways, we will actually resemble God. Second, Athanasius and the other Greek fathers take with absolute seriousness the idea that adoption makes us one with Christ. Christ's humanity is directly joined to the divine word, the eternal Son, and when God joins his humanity to ours, we participate by grace in the Son's relationship to the Father. Chiefly, then, we're deified in the sense that in being joined to Christ, we are joined to the deity. This understanding of what is involved in the Incarnation and our salvation forms an important part of Athanasius' argument with the Arians that Christ must be 
uh, fully divine. I'll try to break down the logic of the argument, which goes roughly like this. What we need to be saved from is death. We can only be saved from it if we are given everlasting life. Only God properly, intrinsically, has everlasting life. God properly, intrinsically, has everlasting life because God is life. Therefore, we can only be saved if God gives us God's very self. But the fundamental claim of the gospel is that Christ is our Savior, the one who gives us everlasting life. Now, Christ cannot give us what he does not properly what does not properly intrinsically belong to him. He cannot give us what he is not himself. So if he gives us what belongs to God alone, he must be God. To sum up the whole idea a little differently in one sentence, something can only act according to its nature. And if Christ does what only God can do, then Christ must be God by nature. Athanasius would extend this line of thinking to argue for the divinity of the Holy Spirit, who applies saving grace to us. Gregory of Nazianzus made the same theological move. In his fifth theological oration, he derides the idea that the Spirit is a created being by asking rhetorically, If he has the same rank as I have, how can he make me God, or how can he join me with deity? Once again, it's important to notice that what is meant here by a human being being made God is that the person is joined to God, not that the person ceases to be a creature. Elsewhere in this oration, Gregory writes, We receive the Son's light from the Father's light in the light of the Spirit. The statement reflects the idea, common to the Cappadocian Fathers, that everything we receive from God comes to us from the Father, through the Son, in the Holy Spirit, which, in turn, reflects how the divine persons stand in relation to one another within the Trinity. The Son is generated by the Father, and the Spirit proceeds from the Father, through the Son. In this same oration, Gregory applies the famous word homoousios to the Spirit, asserting that the Spirit is consubstantial with the Father, sharing the Father's essence, just like the Son. To most of us who are not Eastern Orthodox, the language and, indeed, the concept of deification feels somewhat alien. However, it played a significant role in 4th century arguments for the full divinity of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Also, while deification is a distinctive element of Eastern soteriology, it's by no means without a history in the West. Augustine is an important witness to this. In one of his Christmas sermons, he proclaims, A far brighter hope has beamed forth upon the earth, life in heaven promised to dwellers on earth. To make us believe this, we were first asked to accept a thing more unbelievable. Designing to make gods of those who were men, he who was God was made man. Elsewhere, Augustine is very careful to delineate the difference between what it means for Christ to be the Son of God and what it means for us to be children of God. But we should note that for Augustine, as for Athanasius, our transformation in glorification is made possible by the Incarnation. Indeed, it was precisely to bring about that ultimate transformation that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The language of deification may make us uncomfortable. Maybe it should. On the other hand, 2 Peter 1.4 says that the divine power has granted us all things pertaining to life and godliness, so that we may become partakers of the divine nature. Whatever that means, it sounds like something better than comfort.